Once upon a time, there lived a girl named Deliana. She was an artist and a free thinker. And like most free thinkers, she would refuse to accept the absurdities of the political system in her country. Instead, she chose to mock them openly. But her country was communist Bulgaria, and free thought came at a price. At 19, Deliana was punished for speaking her mind. The regime that systematically used psychiatry for political purposes tried to discredit her and many like her by labeling them mentally ill. In those times, a mark of shame and destruction. Deliana was diagnosed with schizophrenia, a condition she did not have. The diagnosis also gave the regime authorization to routinely take her away from her home and place her in a mental hospital. There, she would be forced to receive electroshocks through her brain without anesthesia or muscle relaxants while fully awake. Five, ten, twenty, fifty, a hundred. Apart from the brutal pain, she also suffered bone, muscle and tooth damage. Today, we say that this is torture dressed up as therapy. It was performed by a monstrous regime, but allowed by an indifferent society. Deliana committed suicide at age 37. She was my aunt and my best friend. When she died, I was 17. My sadness was swallowed whole by my anger. It was this anger that led me to journalism soon after. I dedicated years to undercover investigations of state social care institutions for people with intellectual and mental health disabilities across Eastern Europe. These are places where one is condemned to spend their entire life, often in a never-ending, eternal suffering. I saw children aged seven, nine, ten, who have never left their cribs, fading away from lack of love. I met people who were caged or chemically restrained with harmful medication. I saw adults and babies who were merely stored, not treated, punished, not helped, until it was time to die, often in an unnamed, unmarked grave. It took years of angry reporting until the first institution was shut down after an article I wrote. But it didn't feel like a victory, more like a promise for my own impending defeat. Change was taking forever, and I didn't have forever. To beat time, I had to become we, and we had to become thousands. So I moved to activism, first informally by joining forces with other passionate people in the field, Later I, co-founded the, later, I founded the uh, campaigns program of the leading human rights organization in my home country. We led advocacy and awareness-raising campaigns on many human rights issues. And we would often team up with artists in our effort to make the public care and push with us for change. Just one example, this work is actually an infographic about the number of children with intellectual disabilities who we found died in Bulgarian institutions for a period of 10 years, 238. The tulips represent the different causes of death, malnutrition, neglect, abuse. The rays of the sun stand for the month, months of the year, and one could clearly see that most children died during the winter. This image gripped people by the throat and became central for a huge campaign, leading to thousands and thousands of signatures demanding immediate justice and reform. This campaign ultimately fueled a much larger process, leading to the current closure of all such children institutions in the country. When I think about the inhumane suffering I have observed all these years, I have one question. How did we let this happen? And I believe that we all need to pause and think 
What else are we allowing as a society that would shame us in 30 years? Is it the raging economic inequality? Or the mass privacy violations? Or the violent discrimination and stigma? Or the people losing their rights, freedoms and lives for voicing an opinion? For their sexual orientation? For their gender, religion or color? The opposite of diversity is not uniformity, it's oppression. The opposite of justice is not injustice, it's tyranny. But humans, you and I, we tend to normalize the unthinkable and shrug at the sight of it. That's the way things are. Nothing can be done. We rationalize the unspeakable, forgetting that foundations that might seem unshakably strong today could easily crumble while we sleep, that our comfort is fragile, that this concerns us all, that all injustice is in fact personal. We need empathy to replace apathy. But how do we achieve empathy? My answer is through art. My aunt remained an artist until the day she died. It was not her paintings that the regime feared, but her words and actions. However, it failed to see that it was art that kept her alive. I saw how art can heal. But my aunt also told me that it can inspire and transform during the many nights in her room, stacked ceiling high with art books, we would sit beside her tiny coffee table, me in my PJs, my aunt in her robe, and we would discuss life and often art for hours. From Picasso through Goya to the Beatles, we would talk about how art operates outside all norms, how no one can own it, nor a regime, nor a group, how it grips the heart. Art can achieve things that information can't, my aunt would say. And as an activist, I have observed that power. Many human rights workers today struggle to translate formidable issues into a language that makes people care and compels them to act. Mere facts and statistics don't do the trick and neither do reports or statements on their own. Art, however, can be transcending, connecting us to stories and issues on a deeper, emotional level. Art can create a visceral response. Art can make the distant feel personal. I believe it's time for an empathy revolution, a global movement for respect, equality, dignity and justice through art. We need to bridge human rights and art as a catalyst for social change, to bring activists and artists to work deeply together, creating works that bring awareness and inspire action. There already are amazing examples of powerful art with purpose. But I believe that targeted work in this direction could be one of the ways to fix our society. So this is what I, together with several like-minded people, have recently devoted ourselves to. We are in the very beginning of our work, but we already have projects like our collaboration with photographer John Lowenstein, postcards from Ferguson. This is an interactive piece that creates a simple way to initiate conversations about the complex and often difficult issue of race. It invites people to share their thoughts and feelings on racial inequality and injustice with their friends and family. My favorite one is by Tyrone, a high school student in New York City, to Santa. Dear Santa, I want a pony and a riot shield. Years after her death, while flipping through my aunt's journal, I noticed one sentence. It was a question that my aunt had repeatedly scribbled in between other thoughts. Am I alive? It was a self-check, the same way one might perform a self-exam for cancer, except this was a check for a tumor on the soul. Do I still care? 
Do I still matter? Am I alive? I believe we are only alive through others. Our heartbeat is timed with the beats in other hearts. Our story is written with words said by others. We have a voice only if we help others speak. And our power is measured not by how many people we crush, but by how many we are able to lift and carry on our shoulders. We are the giants our future needs. An empathy revolution starts at the heart. So I challenge you to ask yourself the question that my aunt asked herself. Am I alive? And what can I do to make myself more alive today? Thank you. Yana.